When the earth was at its brink of extinction, there was a forbidden kingdom where no humans were allowed to enter. That forbidden kingdom was covered in dense miasma and was home to monstrous vassals who once dominated and devoured mankind. Hidden inside a mysterious world tree, a new demonic king began to reign over the forbidden kingdom. This is the story about the king of beasts and a mysterious human princess. On one moonlit night, two strange masked human knights enter the forbidden kingdom's outskirts with a human female prisoner inside their carriage. The iron cage gate opens for the two knights, so they take out the cuffed girl from the carriage and order her to enter the hallway. Right as she steps into the empty hallway, the gate behind her closes, and the knights quickly leave the place to save their lives. The white-haired girl walks through the hallway, and two chimera guards stop her from going any further. The fox and the snake guard take a good look at the girl and grant her permission to proceed further. She then enters another carriage that looks to be waiting for her and travels through a more rigid path. The girl finally arrives at the Forbidden Kingdom and gets brought to the King of Beasts himself. The counselor named Anubis introduces the girl as the 99th sacrifice offered by the humans to be devoured by the king. The King of Beasts commands the chained girl to look up, and so she reveals her face. Although she looks very beautiful with her ocean eyes and white hair, Anubis finds her unattractively thin and bony. Out of all the other offerings made by the humans, Anubis tells the king that devouring the likes of her will not nourish his needs. So, he proposes to the king to just simply rip her apart in pieces as a display for the nobility and immediately demand for the next sacrifice to be delivered at once. The girl feels that Anubis is being too rude and calls him a dog. For that, she claims that she should be enough to be eaten and even makes faces at Anubis. Anubis apologizes to his majesty on behalf of the girl's insolence, but the king doesn't feel offended and rather gains interest in the girl. He tells Anubis to leave the room at once and even sends a big roar to make things clear that the king's order should be obeyed at once. Anubis misunderstands and leaves the room hastily. The girl isn't scared of the king of beasts, though, as she scolds him for snapping at people for no reason. She innocently even warns the king that if he keeps being short-tempered like that, one day he will be left all alone. Even the tiny monster balls that have been keeping her chains in place realize that she has spoken too much and beg her to apologize immediately. But the girl completely ignores it and instead asks the monster balls names. The two monster balls introduce themselves as Cyan and Clops, which makes them together a one-eyed Cyclops. The king of beasts has had enough of these foolish antics. He gets up, calling the human girl impudent, and grabs her tiny head with his giant claws. He makes the little girl understand that she is in no place to talk and also reminds her that every sacrifice before her trembled in terror in the king's presence. So, if she wants her death to be less agonizing, she should quietly lie down with her face turned toward the ground and beg for mercy. However, the girl isn't scared of the king at all. She even takes this opportunity to touch his paws and dares to call them squishy. The king loses it, so the girl becomes a little serious and explains to him that even if she somehow manages to escape this hellhole, she has no home or family waiting for her. So, she just doesn't mind nor care if the king kills her. The king of beasts finally empathizes with her and exchanges their names. The girl introduces herself as Seraphi, but the king has no name. He has only the blood running in his veins that proves his royalty to the throne. The king sits back in his throne and explains that the sacrificial ritual that Seraphi will be going through will be taking place on the next night of Revelation when the miasma surrounding the kingdom clears. So, the king wants to see how long Seraphi's boldness will last and decides to keep her alive until the day comes. Seraphi has freedom now until the day of her sacrifice, so she takes her time to roam around the palace. However, the Lord's speakers are absolutely unhappy about a human roaming freely in their kingdom and complain to Counselor Anubis. Anubis calms them down by saying that Seraphi is not free at all as she is still in chains. The Wolf Lord speaker demands to know if the king wants to keep the girl as his pet, and the Goblin Lord also expresses how much of a whim the previous king also was. He reveals that 100 years ago, the Great War happened between the beasts and the humans. His late majesty made peace with the humans and ended the war, but since the beasts had the upper hand in the war, the terms of the truce demanded a sacrifice made by humans. So, the goblin lord makes it clear to Anubis that the king cannot go against the terms of the truce because playing games with humans will ultimately leave him vulnerable. Meanwhile, the king sneaks behind Seraphi while she is enjoying the view with Cyan and Clops. 
he easily carries her on his lap and orders her to return to his chambers at once. They return to his chambers, and then Seraphi explains that she only went outside because she felt bored inside the king's empty chambers. However, the king thinks that his chambers should lack nothing, so Seraphi gives him an idea to add some flowers in the room to brighten things up. The king has no interest in flowers. Besides, flowers do not grow because of the miasma of this land, and the miasma only clears when the moon shines on the night of revelation, the same night when a human must be sacrificed. Seraphi realizes that the king is no fun, let alone his chambers. The king again warns her not to leave this room nor his sight as she will be killed if she is seen by others. Seraphi understands that the king is worried about her, so she agrees to stay in his chambers until her death day. But the king again makes it clear that he doesn't care for her and can tear her apart right away. Still, Seraphi isn't afraid of him because she knows of something much scarier. She goes on to tell the king about a story when she was just a child and an awful stormy night. She was reading an old book while her elder sister was asleep. Seraphi learned from that book that her name means sacrifice in an ancient language. So, she got up to look for answers. When she left her room, she eavesdropped on her parents saying that she was adopted in this family to be offered as a sacrifice to the forbidden kingdom. Discovering that her parents were the actual monsters, it broke her heart and terrified her. However, the king's eyes are nothing like the cold stares of her fake parents, so she isn't scared of him at all. Seraphi knows the king fakes being angry, and that the king also starts pitying her. The king decides to visit an old fortress city called Dog Tao alongside his counselor, and Seraphi. Cyanclops tells her that this city is almost in ruins because it is the nearest to Yona, the human country. So, this place was also heavily affected by the Great War and the scars are still visible even after a hundred years. Seraphi goes upwards to take a look around and sees that below a cliff, there's a city in ruins. The king realizes that Cyanclops are no help, so he commands them to leave Seraphi alone from now on. The king explains that the town down there is a lawless zone. This lawless town is the hotbed of rebellion because it's the farthest from the palace. Even now, people here often get conflicted with humans. That's why the king is here to stop everyone from shedding needless blood, and the only way to do so is through fear and terror as it's the most reliable method of all. Seraphi takes a deep look at the king and understands that it must be hard to be the ruler of a kingdom. Meanwhile, Cy and Klops return to Anubis just to be questioned about the king's location. Klops informs Anubis that the king went to a cliff with Seraphi to take a look at the ruins. Anubis becomes concerned about them, but there's not much that he can do. Seraphi suddenly smells something nice and becomes immediately enticed. She unknowingly starts following the smell and finds a ruin filled with blossomed flowers. The king tells Seraphi that this is the only place where flowers bloom as there's not much miasma here. Seraphi wonders if that is the reason why the king brought her here. The king nods and tells her that he can't have her wandering around the palace, so this was the only substitute. Seraphi plucks some of the flowers and secretly makes a flower crown out of them while the king is not paying attention. She makes him wear the crown and tells him that he looks adorable. Although the king acts as if he's angry, he actually feels much better thanks to Seraphi. A storm approaches the forbidden kingdom, so the king and his subordinates return to the palace. The king tries to remind Seraphi that she will be sacrificed in a few days, but she doesn't let him finish and hugs him tightly in fear of lightning. The king finds it funny that Seraphi doesn't fear beasts yet gets frightened by lightning sounds. The king realizes that Seraphi must have remembered the horrible stormy night when she discovered her parents' true colors. So, he offers her his absurdly large tail to comfort her. Seraphi starts getting too comfortable because of the king's tail and also begins to feel warm. She lays in his lap and tells him that he doesn't need to act tough around her anymore. The king remains silent and the little princess falls asleep on his lap. The next few days pass in the blink of an eye. The miasma clouds clear up, and so the night of the ritual has come at last. While Seraphi gets properly dressed as a bride to be sacrificed, Anubis reminds her she should keep her mouth shut on the sacred night. Anubis also explains that the only reason she's getting to wear fancy clothes is that she will become part of his majesty at the end of this ritual, so she needs to dress up like royalty. Anubis informs Seraphi that the king will not show himself tonight as tradition and then leads the way to the altar chamber and tells Seraphi to wait quietly there. It's very dark at the altar room, and she cannot see a single thing. 
but a traitor is waiting there already to take her place and kill the king when he comes to devour her. The treacherous monster reveals that the king is indecisive and panders to humans, so he must take over the throne. After revealing his intentions, the monster goes to kill Seraphi, but another human suddenly appears and intercepts the hit. Seraphi steps up and defends the honor of the king. This surprises the mysterious human, and he disarms the monster in the next few seconds. The human tries to leave quietly, but Seraphi recognizes him and asks if he is the king. She is absolutely sure that this human is the king, but the king doesn't even consider himself to be a ruler. He reveals that although he was born a beast, he has human blood running in his veins. So, when the moonlight of the revelation exposes his human form, he merely hides in darkness and waits for it to pass. The king calls himself a coward and gives up his act as he couldn't get himself to fool a mere girl. That's why he considers himself a pitiful weakling. However, Seraphi thinks otherwise. She tears her dress and treats his wounds. She tells him that he is actually very strong and a considerate person. Seraphi has realized that the king hasn't killed a single human and used his own blood on the floor to make it seem that the sacrifices were made. Seraphi acknowledges the king is the strongest, as he is the one who sacrifices the most. However, she wants her life to end because she has no place to go and doesn't want to see his cold eyes anymore. The king rejects her wish and removes her shackles. They both share the tightest hug and stay together for the entire night. The next day, the king announces to his council that he would be taking Seraphi as his queen and won't hear any objections. Seraphi is the only happy person in the room, and she gladly gifts the king a name, Leonhart, which means brave-hearted. The king, Leonhart, gladly accepts his name, and they happily live